Welcome to this series of presentations from our GOR Working Group PMO. In March 2021, we hosted a virtual event dedicated to mathematical optimization and quantum computing. Five presentations have been recorded and are now available on YouTube. Elizabeth Lobe from DLR organized this virtual event with us and gave a great presentation about the necessary steps to transform a mathematical optimization problem into a quadratically unconstrained optimization problem, a QBO, and finally embedding it into an adiabatic quantum annealer. All right. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, in letting me talk today. So uh, uh, it was very nice that you approached us uh, as a DLR again to uh, organize this workshop with you. And yeah, we've already heard there are different quantum technologies, and one of them is the quantum annealer. And uh, what you have maybe already heard is there is one quantum annealer you can already buy. So there is this quantum annealing machine of D-Wave, you can buy it and you can start running your problems on it. And if it was that easy, I would not need to talk today. So I would like to show you the necessary steps to, to work with this machine to actually get some solution out of it um, and also um, show you some questions around these steps um, which arise there and unfortunately I cannot answer all of them um, but uh, I will try to show you the direction so um, okay so my background is mathematics but unfortunately without any physics we, we cannot deal with quantum computing so I will do a very short introduction about the, uh, the quantum annealing again. So Bettina just already uh, did it very well. I will try to approach it from a, from a different direction to show you how this uh, affects then uh, the, the dealing with the machine later on. So um, some physics. There is this, maybe you already heard about, the Schrödinger equation. It looks very difficult, you don't need to care about it, but it essentially uh, provides the time evolu evolution of a quantum state, of a quantum system over time. Okay, so, uh, and this operator, this H, is an operator describing the energy of the system. And, okay, it's just a linear differential equation. Um, if we have a look at stationary states, so this, uh, in this above equation, there can be an ordinary state in there. If we look at stationary states, that means they don't change over time. Those states uh, fulfill the most simpler eigenvalue problem, which is shown on the right. And um, this actually shows that the, the quantum system described by this Hamiltonian, uh, which is self-adjoint, has discrete energy levels. So these EKs are uh, the, the eigenvalues and they are um, discrete and they are real because of this uh, self-adjoint um, operator. And each of the states above can be written as a weighted sum over the over basis of those eigenstates. And the one state we are interested in is the ground stage, ground state which uh, is the one with the lowest energy, E0. And now, if we have one quantum system, we can transfer it into another system uh, in some time T. So like if you imagine uh, an, an atom, there are uh, electrons running around, and if you, by, for example, increase some, some outer um, influence, those electrons tend to, to change uh, the place. So um, we can do it, um, or we can see it as a, as a transfer from an uh, H0 to uh, some HT by some function. And this uh, function is the, the change of the system. And for instance, this can be done by, by like I said, ex uh, changing external influences. Okay, lots of physics, but what does that mean for our 
uh, adiabatic or annealing uh, machine. So the starting point of this machine was the so-called adiabatic theorem, which says a system that starts in an eigenstate of the initial Hamiltonian will end in the corresponding eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian with high probability if the evolution is so. So on the left side, we see some ordered, uh, we see a quantum system with some ordered energy levels. And on the right side, we see the final system. And these are systems we can transfer into another. How it's done physically, we don't know. But in theory, those are the, the, the quantum systems. And it says, okay, if we do the transfer too fast, then if we start it in a, in a state um, with, with, with some energy, then we jump somewhere. So the, the system does not have the time to adopt. Um, but so this was too fast. But if we do it according to, to this theorem, if we do it slowly enough, then if we start it in the ground state of this uh, first quantum system, we will end up in the ground state of the final system. And this yeah, what does it mean, slow enough and to get uh, it with high probability? So this is determined by the so-called spectral gap, which means this is the, the difference of the, um, of the first uh, eigenvalues at some point in this evolution. So if they cross someone, um, yeah, we, we don't have the chance to, to get the ground state, but if they somehow have some, some distance um, we theoretically know the, the time, how slowly is enough to, to change the system and still get a solution with high probability. So there's always some, some physical effects. Of course, this means in an ideal system. So what does it mean now for, for optimization? So, um, we could think of solving a minimization problem by this so-called adiabatic evolution. So it would be nice if we have such a function um, which has some binary var uh, variables and we want some real value out of it. If we would know the values, we could just sort them and find the, the solution. But it would be nice if we would know a quantum system encoding the, as an energy, those uh, values. So despite we don't know them, maybe we can build up such a quantum system. This is the starting point. And then we, we build up an initial system, which is easy to prepare, uh, which where we know the ground state, we can prepare the ground state. And then we transfer this first system to the second system, slowly enough, and then hopefully in the end we will end up in the final system which corresponds to our function and by measuring we get a solution and uh, have solved our optimization problem. Of course, this is uh, in an ideal world. So and how could this first um, initial system look like? So ideally it would have the, the eigenstate or the ground state where all possibilities of zero and one in the variables are just uh, equally distributed. So we have a superposition of all possible inputs to our function f. And then um, by this adiabatic evolution, we break up this superposition and finally, hopefully, um, get our solution. So this final Hamiltonian could somehow look like this. It's, uh, it's a typical way of writing in, in, in physics, but essentially those uh, vectors on the right, um, they, 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 uh, they are the, the, the identity matrix. And so we have a diagonal matrix where we have the, the function values on the diagonal, uh, of course, we ca cannot compute it fully. That would mean we would compute all the values. But if we could encode it in a quantum system, this would be perfect. 
So, and then, um, yeah, let's have a look. So, uh, we started, if we start in the real world, um, maybe we have already identified some model problem. This is um, already a lot of work on its own. So, our starting point is a combinatorial optimization problem. So, and um, the way that the wave people maybe thought or maybe not, but uh, what is a nice physical system such that we could model the previous uh, uh, theorem and the uh, evolution? So we need a physical system model, and of course we need to somehow realize it in the real world. So, and what they came up with is the so-called Ising model, which um, describes how spins in a magnetic field behave. So there's um, several atoms or whatever, there's spins and electrons, and they, they are in a local, they are arranged locally, and this model describes how they uh, behave, especially to their local neighbors. Uh, and this model is quite nice because there's a you can really easily transfer it into a mathematical speaking, so to the Hubo and Ising problem. I will uh, tell you in a few minutes what that is. So essentially that means, so we have the spins up and spins down um, that refer to plus and minus one uh, variables. And the nice thing is from the step from combinatorial optimization, from arbitrary combinatorial optimization problem to the Cubo and Ising problem, it's, so to say, it's known. We know how to encode it, we know how to reduce it, and we especially know how the solution corresponds to each other. Um, yeah, so uh, this is clear. And, uh, but what's not clear is how to get from the physical model to our mathematical Ising model. And there's another step in between. So now we have this D-wave machine really realizing this Ising model with these spins and things like this. And this machine um, inserts some restrictions. So because of the physical realization, we have some restrictions. And this is what I call the restricted Ising uh, problem over the chimera. We will see what that means in a few minutes. So, and the thing is, if you want to go from your combinatorial optimization problem to the D-Wave machine, um, there are these layers in between. And like I said, the first loop, this is already closed, but uh, what I'm investigating in my PhD is, is the second loop because there are already a lot of questions which are not answered yet. So before going on the machine, we have to clarify that um, the, the transference from the Ising problem to the restricted Ising problem means actually that we solve the same problem. So how do we do that? Um, there are some, some steps in between I will show you, like the, the embedding and the parameter setting, and then you will get some solution, and, but you still don't know if it's feasible or will, will, it, will it be optimal, so this, this loop is not closed yet. Um, actually, if you buy a machine, such a device machine, um, they come with, a, with an API, so it would be possible to directly put your cubalizing problem in there and get something back. But um, most likely, the output will not tell you anything. <laughs> so that's why uh, we will look uh, deeper inside of these loops. So, and um, yeah, and the first thing I would like to start with is a, it's a brief uh, recapturing of the steps needed to transform your combinatorial optimization problem to such an Ising or Cubo problem, and of course clarify what is a Cubo and Ising problem, and how do we close this loop. All right. Uh, are there any questions under here? 
So there was actually a question that David has uh, answered, which is great. Thanks for the response there, but we should maybe read it out for everyone. Um, why is that initial eigenstate preferred? So the uniform superposition over any alternatives? And his response is, it happens to be the lowest energy state of a system and therefore easy to set up. Anything you would love to, to add to that? Yeah, maybe you will see, uh, or I will, I will uh, go into detail about this in a, in a few seconds. So, um, of course, this, this uh, state is preferable because you have the superposition of all states. So, um, uh, there's probably the, the likelihood that you end up in a, in a state that is, is not too far away. So, um, I will explain you what, what that means in terms of the Ising problem in a, in a few seconds, I think. So, um, all right, what is the Ising problem? Um, it's essentially this, so it's a minimization problem over a function um, where, we, where we put uh, variables in which can take the value minus one or plus one. And this function uh, is a quadratic function. So we have um, uh, monomials of degree one and monomials of degree two, which are weighted. So um, if we have a look at those J values, if we ignore all of them, which are zero, we can define a so-called interaction graph um, with edges where we have non-zero J values and the given weights on the nodes. And this can be represented, for instance, as such a graph of switches. So uh, we have such a graph of switches where we have a weighting on each switch and a weighting on or so-called strength on each of the couplings between the switches. And the question now is how to turn on and off the switches such to minimize the whole system. And um, the way D-Wave uh, is doing it, as far as I understand, is they start with a system where we have a superposition in all the switches. So all switches are simultaneously on plus and minus without any weight assigned. So this is the starting point. And then uh, they turn on this annealing process, which is uh, the algorithm, the only algorithm this machine can, so they turn on this annealing process um, and turn on these uh, magnetics of field. So they switch on the, the weightings and after a while the superpositions break up and finally we have hopefully found uh, a solution. So this is the, the, the idea behind this uh, initial state of having all superposition. Um, all right. So, and because this minus and plus one, I think for us as a mathematician, it's not very intuitive. So, um, we used to like uh, to work with a zero and one, so binary variables. So, and we can uh, easily transfer this kind of problem to the so called quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. Uh, by this uh, affine transformation where we just uh, insert, instead of the S variables, we use the X variables, which are either zero and one. Um, yeah, we can easily transfer this. And there we need to say is that if we do so, the interaction graph stays the same. So uh, if we had non-zero weightings in the Ising model, we will have non-zero weighting uh, in the cubo um, for the edges. So the interactions will stay the same. In the uh, monomials with degree one, the, the coefficients can cancel out, but essentially the graph stays the same. So, and um, yeah, since it's more approachable to use these, uh, we will use this cubo in the following and to have a look how to get to this cubo format. So because we don't have any constraints, we have binary variables, how to get there. Ah, and uh, we have to say this is an NP-complete problem solving this cubo. So um, 
So if the D-Wave machine is really capable of folding it fast and nicely, it would be great. So, um, all right. So let's recapture the steps how to get to the Cubo. So essentially, if we have an ILP or whatever, there are, there are integer variables, maybe. So, and now we can represent this integer variable by a binary representation. So the, the main thing here is we have this uh, binary encoding uh, and where we have this uh, powers of two, we sum up the binary variables, and here in between is simply the remaining part if our z variable wasn't a power of two, we need some, some remaining part. And so to represent an integer variable, we need the logarithm of the boundaries uh, uh, amount of, of, uh, of qubits to represent it. This is one. This is the way. One way to encode an integer variable. There are different ways. So one could decide also not to use powers of two, but maybe um, the the whole range of of integers in between the boundaries. This is a so-called uh, one-hot encoding. But then you need to introduce another constraint. So we will stick with this as this is the usual way to do it. All right, so now we, our problem is binary, and uh, we would like to go a step further. So maybe our um, objective function or our constraints, they don't have a degree of two, but they have a larger degree. So, um, but we can reduce the degree of any arbitrary sort of Boolean function, like it's written there, by replacing a product with an additional variable. So we're just taking out of the product of X, uh, xj and xk and just insert instead another variable, rjk. And because of this, of course, we need to enforce the, the equality, so we need to add another constraint. So this is the one below. Um, all right, so now we have a degree two, we have a, a, binary variables, so we are nearly uh, close to cubo, but the next part is the unconstrained. So um, let's, ah, yeah, and what I need to say here, of course, we, the, both of these things, we need to add additional variables to our uh, functions. All right, let's have a look at the constraints. Constraints usually are um, reduced using pen, so-called penalty terms. Um, and for each constraint, we, we try to find a function which is zero if our, uh, if our chosen uh, x values satisfy the constraint, and otherwise uh, it should give a positive value. Um, why it is so? Because then we can simply add this penalty term to the object function with a certain weighting, and um, by this enforce the the solution to fulfill the the constraint. Because it's of course preferable to set the value of this penalty term to zero when minimizing the function. Um, and if we have a set of constraints, we will just do it for all of them, and then uh, we finally have our objective function plus the sum of all penalty terms somehow weighted. Why somehow weighted? Um, of course, um, the benefit by, by breaking a constraint in the, in the objective function should not um, exceed the, the penalty you you add by this term. So how these penalty weights uh, should be chosen um, is another question. So, but if you look at this objective function, you can also say, okay, maybe we don't uh, we don't want to optimize anything, but uh, we have some a set of of 
uh, yeah, set of constraints and we want to have a look at the feasible solutions of this set of constraints, thus by just having a look at this sum of penalty terms um, as an objective function itself, you can sample from the feasible solutions. So what does it mean uh, if you put it to the, to the annealing machine, ideally it should um, prefer all, so it, it should give you the solution of zero because this is the, the minimum value of this sum of the penalty terms. And uh, if it's a value of zero, then the, uh, the choice of for X values should be a feasible um, solution. So this uh, is also a possibility. And how do we construct these penalty terms? So we, we say, okay, they need to be zero. Uh, if the constraint is fulfilled, and uh, if not, they should be larger than zero. How do we do that? So um, if we have such a linear constraint like here on this side, um, which is bounded by a lower and an upper bound, we can introduce a so-called slack variable, uh, which could take on all the range between the lower and the upper bound. And then we have uh, an equation. And by um, rearranging this equation to have zero on the one side, um, and then squaring the other side, we will get a penalty term that really fulfills our um, our constraint. So if we put in something uh, which is not in the interval, we will get some value, either plus or minus one, but because of the squaring, it will be larger than zero. And only if we fulfill our constraint, we will get a value of zero. Of course, here again, we need to, um, for the Z, we need to again encode this finally as a binary variable. <coughs> All right, and um, yeah, we already had the, the point with the reduction. So a reduction constraint is a bit special because if we would do the same procedure as above, we would not be able to reduce the degree of our function. Um, but by a simple uh, look or by a look at the, the Boolean, um, how's it called, Boolean table, you can uh, easily find this uh, penalty function here, which uh, which uh, enforces the the equality of the product to this new variable r, because it's zero if there is the equivalent, and uh, otherwise it's larger than zero. All right. So this is how we can. Um, can reduce our constraints, and finally we have our cubo. So, um, but the thing is, okay, we now we don't have any constraints anymore. But our interaction graph uh, from the original problem is now extended by lots of additional edges, um, especially due to the squaring of the of those linear terms. Because the squaring, you get the product of each of the variables you will get a complete subgraph. Why this is important, we will see uh, soon. And um, further, we, our inequalities, uh, the, the coefficients of our inequalities are restricted to discrete values. Why is that? Because in our encoding, we need to make sure every so every value in between the lower and the upper bound should be possible and it uh, should be weighted equally. So all the, the slack variable needs to encode all the allowed possibilities and none of them should be penalized in between. So um, that's why we are restricted because of the, the ability to, to encode it as a slack variable to discrete values. And of course, there's this question again, how to choose this penalty weight. So, um, like I said, it should exceed the maximal contribution of the objective if the constraint is violated. 
So if we have a look at a feasible solution and an infeasible solution, and uh, the benefit you get from it should be um, <clears throat> should not be larger um, than the, the penalty you get from adding this term. All right. So in theory, like we would say, okay, just in theory, it's infinity, or if we can't say infinity, okay, it would just be some the sum of the the absolute uh, values of the coefficients of the of the objective function. But of course, this will be a huge value, maybe. So can we realize this practically? We will see. <laughs> All right. So let's have a look at an example. Maybe this was uh, very theoretically. Uh, let's have a look at an example and uh, let's break cryptography. So uh, I, I thought maybe let's have a let's have an example which is uh, maybe applicable. And let's so let's have a look at integer factorization. So given an, uh, a non-prime number, find uh, two values which are which multiplied. Uh, are again our um, given value, and uh, if we think of cryptography, um, we can directly say, okay, we know those two integers are primes. All right, so how can we do this? So on the right, it's just a constraint, and we could say, okay, let's encode this first as a as a cube ball. So by binary representation. We can simply replace x and y with the sum of the of the binary um, variables, which is multiplied then this full sum. And now, okay, we have uh, quadratic quadratic terms in there, and uh, if we want to later on reduce this constraint, quadratic terms, we would again square them. So we would get uh, terms of degree four, so we can reduce those terms right away by the reductions given here. So in the first sum, we replace the product with the reduction variable and remember the, the additional constraints we need to have to add. So by combining those to a cube ball, we, we take the, the penalty terms for the reduction uh, at the first part, and then apply our our method to to transfer this linear equation into a penalty term by squaring it. So here we have um, the the penalty term enforcing that our product is actually our uh, value again. So in here, in this case, we assumed, either we assumed, we know the, the, the number of binary variables which we need for the, uh, for the factors, or we, we do a scanning of all possible combinations. But by doing so and using this cubo, we could already um, go on the machine and put it there. So like I said, um, now we have this cube ball and we could use the D-Wave API, put our integer factorization problem there, but most likely you won't get the factors you, you want to have. Because um, this depends, or this is because of the steps which are hidden by the D-Wave API and which we like, would like to dive into now. So what is the loop? Um, that needs to be closed here? What, what are the steps that need to be considered? Um, um, by this, I want to, I want to show you the, the restrictions the D-Wave machine uh, inserts. So first of all is the so-called Chimera interaction graph. So like Bettina Hughes already said, the, the D-Wave quantum system is formed by those superconducting circuits, which are somehow overlapping. Um, and they overlap in a very, very specific way, like you see uh, in the right picture. So you have four horizontally and four vertically, and they overlap in a specific way. And um, in those circuits, we have spins 
encoded or which are anti-parallel to external magnetic field. And what we can do is we can adjust the couplings where those circuits overlay and some, some local fields. So what does that mean for us? If we contract those loops to single nodes, uh, we would get a graph like this. So um, those so-called unit cells, like on the right uh, above, it's a so-called unit cell. There's a place like a chessboard, and they overlap at the, at the edges. So and that's why we would get some kind of graph like this, and it's called the chimera graph. So and if we have n rows and n columns, we will say C and M. And um, due to this overlaying, uh, overlapping circuits, we have eight qubits per unit cell forming a complete bipartite graph with four nodes in each partition. So that's one part like here. And as they arrange, are arranged like in the chessboard, we have the uh, horizontally connected vertices and we have the uh, horizontally and the vertically uh, connected. So, um, yeah, it looks like this. And the current machine has about or has exactly 16 times 16 such unit cells arranged. So we have uh, 2048 qubits in total. And what we can see here in this picture, so the, the maximal degree of this of one node there is four inside such a unit cell and at most two to the outside. All right, so what does that mean? Uh, that means the, our cubo can only have non-zero um, coefficients for the quadratic terms that correspond to such a graph. And usually, of course, your problem does not do that. So what is the possibility to, to overcome this issue? It's the so-called embedding. And here I would like to show you on the right hand side, we have the chimera of size three times three. And on the left, we have the complete graph. So your problem could be a complete graph and you would like to transfer it on the machine. And this you will do over the so-called embedding. Um, how is it done? You, you have, so you need to look for, for connected set of nodes in the hardware that you can, that you can couple couple strongly. Um, what does it mean, couple strongly? We, we will see in the future, but uh, for, uh, for now, so we, we choose this set of uh, nodes, and if we would compress them together here on the right-hand side, we would get exactly the complete graph. So by combining um, physical nodes to logical nodes, we can overcome this uh, interaction problem. And actually, what you see on the right-hand side is uh, the best you can do for the complete graph. So we uh, will need um, a power of two, uh, uh, so n squared qubits um, to embed a complete graph. You can add one more node to the complete graph uh, by extending the, the, the structure here. And now you can open up one of those one of those chains here, and then you will get one more node. But as you see now, the the graph is full, so you can't do better than this. So in a graph uh, with n um, unit cells in a row and n unit cells in a column, you can embed maximally uh, a complete graph of four n plus this one. All right. So, um, yeah, maybe, of course, this is a very restrictive way. So in the current D-Wave architecture, if you would try to use a, a complete graph, um, although you have 2,000 and about 50 qubits, you can only use a complete graph with 64 qubits. That's not so much. 
So uh, maybe if we can do different than the complete graph, of course, there are a few known um, so-called chimera miners um, that look pretty funny, but probably they won't fit to your problem too. But let's have a look at some of those miners. So if we uh, combine inside a unit cell, we get, for instance, such a graph like this, which has um, a, a 2D lattice as a subgraph or a 3D lattice. Uh, you can extract there. So maybe your problem already fits like this. Or if you uh, combine them even further, you might get this uh, miner, which has a, also a, a grid subgraph, but with more interactions between the, between the vertices. All right, so maybe your problem already fits there, but, or here's some more funny uh, chimera miners, uh, yeah, <laughs> all right. But in general, you you will need to find your embedding for your problem. So what is the actual definition of such an embedding? It's a function which maps vertices in the original graph to vertices in the hardware graph. And we have some, some constraints that need to be fulfilled. So because we want to couple them strongly, um, this um, embedding needs to introduce connected subgraphs. So for all logical nodes, the corresponding qubits need to be connected. And of course, um, uh, if we have one chain here, it cannot intersect with another chain. And uh, if we had an edge before, between two logical nodes, we also need an edge between the physical nodes somewhere. That's the main restriction. And then the, the original graph G is called a minor of H. And about this problem, uh, in general, to decide whether an arbitrary graph G is a minor of an arbitrary graph H is NP-hard. So because we could say, okay, G is the cycle graph and uh, we would like to embed it into H, so it would be equivalent to the Hamiltonian cycle problem. So um, there are some nice results from Robertson and Simo about uh, if we consider a fixed uh, input or a fixed graph G, um, but it's not clear how the problem behaves uh, if we f if we here in this like here in this case we fix our hardware graph to the chimera graph. So this is still an open question. But what I can tell you is the Hamiltonian cycle problem is easy to solve for this graph. So it always exists if we have uh, unit cell rows or columns larger than one. So you can just use this extendable scheme to, to construct the graph. So this argument for NP hardness is, is not applicable. Okay, so, um, so we need to find an embedding. Maybe we can use the, the, the complete graph embedding, but if we want to go to the machine now, there's another restriction. So, uh, ah, yeah. Let's have a look at the at, at the example again before. So we have our integer factorization problem, which is minimizing this full function, this cubo. And what we see here is that this, because of the squaring, forms a complete graph of this size. All right. So what does that mean? Uh, if we have a look at these, uh, the, the bit length of the factors, it's about the half of the length of the uh, given integer. So uh, this should be less or equal than 65, which is the largest complete graph we can embed in the current hardware. So what we can get is, okay, our uh, given number should have a bit length smaller or equal to 14, um, well, one, I neglected the one. But so um, our value should be smaller or equal to, uh, yeah, 
32,000 and so on. All right, so this is the maximum we can do on the current machine. So for instance, we could try to factor this. But if we do, if we now do reverse thinking, okay, on the current machine, we can do this. What if we could imagine a bigger machine and we would like to solve RSA 100, which has about uh, 330 bits. So in this case, to solve this on the leading machine, this machine would need about 7,000 unit cells. So, which is quite far away from what we have at the moment. But we will see in the future what happens. All right. So now maybe we could go on the machine. But like I said, there's another restriction. Uh, we don't have an, an ideal chimera graph, but due to hardware fault, we have a broken chimera graph. So in this graph structure, there are several broken qubits, which are physically, they are there, but they are switched off by the API uh, because um, when they calibrate the machine, they, they recognize, okay, they deviate too much from the expected value, so we, we switch them off to not disturb the other computation. And um, this, this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this brokenness, so to say, will remain until the next calibration, and usually it's about a year until this change. So for one year, we will have this fixed broken chimera graph, and uh, in the current architecture, there are seven broken qubits out of those 2,000. And of course, you, uh, according to our embeddings, those standard schemes uh, we, we have seen, they do not apply anymore. So how can we overcome this? Um, yeah, the, the D-Wave API comes with an heuristic algorithm, uh, which is quite fast, but um, sometimes it doesn't find any, any embedding. So um, this is still an, an open problem. And the question, given an arbitrary graph G, so our original problem graph, and some broken chimera graph, the question, is G a minor of C? Um, we are currently uh, trying, or we are working on a proof such that uh, this problem is actually an NP-complete problem. So we will need heuristics to embed our problem in the machine. But what we can do is, uh, what we observed uh, in another work is the, the complete graph. So no, not an arbitrary graph, but we, what can we do with a complete graph? And actually by, by looking at this standard scheme again, we can uh, extend it again. And now we are able to just mix it up. So like a, a permutation over the whole uh, chimera graph, and we see those um, connecting elements, which were on the diagonal before, they are now permuted over the whole chimera graph. And what we see here also is that we, between each color, we have two connections. So there's some redundancy, and this redundancy we can use to cut those embeddings off again. We still have every color is connected to every other color but there is now some space for broken qubits. So um, the question is, how do we find these connecting elements such that they still uh, can be, can be uh, extended to a, to, a, to a valid complete graph embedding? And we have shown that this um, can be formulated as a vibrative matching problem with some additional constraints. Um, and due to this additional constraint, so because some of those diagonal elements cannot be matched together with other diagonal elements, because if we would extend, there would not be an edge between them. So um, if we would not have these additional constraints, it would be just a simple bipartite matching problem, which could be found in polynomial time. But because of this restriction, those problems are NP-hard in general. 
Uh, but we could show, due to the structure of the constraint, that it's actually a fixed parameter tractable in the number of broken qubits. So even if we extend the size of the graph, if we fix the number of broken qubits, it can be still uh, calculated fast. And by this, um, we also we also extracted a nice heuristic by excluding some some cases in advance. So this is the result, the latest result of our work in in terms of the embedding. And by this, we also could confirm that the uh, current D-Wave machine actually has the, the 64 complete graph as a minor, although they are broken qubits. All right. So now, um, this was the Chimera graph. Now, just recently, um, D-Wave announced a new hardware graph, which is the so-called Pegasus. It's shown on the right-hand side. Um, it's somehow related to the chimera, so it's somehow derived from its structure, but it's really less approachable due to the larger amount of connections. So, and um, it's called the D-Wave Advantage System, the Pegasus graph, and uh, it has a lot more qubits, so it's about uh, nearly 6,000 qubits, and all of them have a higher degree of 15, um, and we could theoretically embed a complete graph of 282, which is already uh, a number which is quite nice. But this Pegasus structure has two, over 200 uh, broken qubits at the moment, which is a much higher ratio than the, the current Chimera architecture. So it's not clear which um, which complete graph can be embedded there, but we are working on uh, to transfer our results to the Pegasus structure, so the complete graph embedding construction, and also the NP-completeness proof for the general embedding problem, because, like I said, the, the Pegasus is somehow derived from the Chimera and also contains it as a subgraph. All right. so. Now we want to go to the Chimera. We somehow have luckily found uh, an embedding. So can we now calculate on the machine? Yeah, we, we, we have a look. So um, this is our original Cubo or Ising, depends on which variables you put inside. And now we have um, our hardware graph and our embedding function. Of course, now we need to put this objective function over this qubit, so the physical qubit. So we need to get some, some new coefficient for those qubits, such that the, the embedded problem represents our original problem. All right, here in this case, um, since we have only, each, only one edge between each color, uh, we can simply transfer the, the weightings for the, for the edges. We can simply transfer. That's fine. But inside of these chains here, it's not clear how to distribute the weight. So the, the, um, the weighting of a single node before is now spread over several nodes here, and those qubits need to be coupled strongly. Here we are again with this strong coupling. But what does that mean? Um, all right. So the thing is, now we have here uh, a set of, of uh, coefficients. Um, is that actually, does that work? So if we would know our embedding, how do we get those weightings? It's not clear. And then there comes in another restriction. So because uh, the D-Wave machine has a restriction on the parameters, so on the coefficients we can put in there. So uh, first of all, they are bounded, there's a bounded height of the parameters. So the uh, coefficients should be inside an interval, which is totally fine. We can just scale the whole function, would be nice. But there's another thing. There's this so-called, or this restricted parameter precision. 
So um, this parameter precision has a large influence on the spectral gap and thus the success probability of our problem. And um, usually because it's, it's a physical system, we have to tune magnetic fields and things like this. Um, in, a few, in some cases, the machine is not able to resolve the values we would like to put. So, and in, in later, or in, in former research for, for some old D-Wave machine, we found out that the, the parameter precision is about 130. So we can have, so if we scale it to integers, we could have from minus 30 to 30 all integer variables, but no other uh, coefficients would be possible. Um, in the more in the latest uh, systems, maybe this is a bit the range is a bit larger. Uh, we didn't investigate it uh, for a while, but you have to keep that in mind. We have a restricted, a discrete set of coefficients that we can choose, uh, and this limited coefficient range is especially for, of course, the embedded Ising problem we actually want to send to the machine. And this decisively influences the success probability of the machine. So uh, if we have a very large penalty weight for our constraint, or if we set the, the coupling strength very, very large, um, then uh, other values might be set to zero or things like this. Um, and thus the, the problem that is really solved on the machine is not the one that we actually want to solve because it's a different problem. It's, um, it's not resolved like it should. So, um, and also not only the penalty weights and the coupling strength, but also already the coefficient ratio of the unembedded Ising problem plays a big role there. And so how do we choose the parameters such that the original and the embedded problem are provably the same? Um, let's have a look at our integer factorization problem again. So we want to minimize this cue ball. And if we look at this uh, squared term here, we will see the, the largest absolute coefficient will be the product of this power of two, it will be squared. So we will have this power squared. And we also have here some, our large integer n, which will also be multiplied with this, um, with this uh, power of two. But because this is negated here, we will get this largest coefficient. Okay, what does that mean? So if we have a look at our example before, if we want to factorize this number, we will already have uh, a maximum coefficient of 700 or 800 million. So this is quite far away from what the, the machine can resolve, especially if we look at the smallest coefficient in relation to it, which is just two or one. All right, so, um, by, by slightly balancing, so we have this penalty part and this penalty part, by slightly uh, balancing the weight of the one and the other, we can slightly improve, but it will be maybe half the, the maximum coefficient like printed here. All right, so this is already the unembedded problem. And now how do we get to the embedded problem? So let's have a look at our switches again. Uh, we have one switch. It has a weight of three. This is the logical node. And now we want to transfer it into the machine. So in the machine, we have several switches. So here is three. Okay, we could think of, let's distribute the weight of the switch over all switches equally. So there's a plus one everywhere. And okay, since it's three, Let's try to couple them with a minus three. What does that mean? So it means if we switch all switches on, we would get a value of minus three. Okay, and we would know what that means in terms of the logical uh, representation. 
if we switch them all off, all right, we get a value of minus nine, which is fine. Uh, we, because it corresponds to what we expect. If we have a positive value, we expect that the machine should put it on a negative or on a minus one. So the value of minus one, uh, where we all have minus one, is actually lower than where, when we have every plus one. That's fine so far. So like this, we can already see some obvious requirements. So somehow those those weights need to sum up to our original weight and those coupling strengths needs to be uh, lower than zero. But what happens now? Uh, ah, and if we break this chain, we will see, okay, now the, the actual value of, if we, uh, let's see, sum it all up, the actual value is only minus one. So it's really preferable to, to have them all synchronized to plus or to minus one. So what we want to have is really um, for one logical variable, we want to have it all physical variables should have all the same uh, value. Otherwise we would not know if we read out this solution, we would not know what to assign to our original problem. And if we have a look now, of course we don't have separated chains of qubits, but there are connections to other qubits. What happens? So if we switch them all on to plus, we will get a minus four. If we switch them all off or to minus one, we will get a minus eight, okay? But if we break this chain, we will see we will get a minus 16, which is preferred due to the minimization uh, but of course, we don't know uh, in our original problem what should be the value of this variable. So obviously, those minus three was was too weak. So we need to set a stronger coupling strength there. Um, but how should we how should we do it? Um, of course, in theory, again, we would set it to infinity or some very very large value. Or like in the D-Wave API, they are using, um, I think they're just searching for the largest coefficient in the unembedded problem and just take this as a strength. Um, but what is, what is actually um, the, the, the minimum value we need to take there? And this is uh, the so-called weight distribution problem I, I, I'm working on in my PhD. And um, there, I just give a short um, short overview on, on how I try to tackle this problem. So if we have a look at this embedded cubo, we just take one, one embedded uh, node and only those uh, vertices that are neighbor to it. So we just observe this part of the cubo uh, and rename all those outer variables so we have the S variables for those in the chain and the T variables for those on the outer side. And what we want to have is for whatever happens here outside in the green T variables, whatever happens there, the variables in my chain should either be all minus one or they should either all be plus one for whatever happens outside. Or in uh, differently speaking, um, for all assignments to S and T, my, my actual um, evaluation of the function should be larger than if we put uh, a minus or a plus one there. But of course, due to the large amount of possibilities here, this is an exponential number of brute force constraints. So, uh, you can't solve it like this directly. But what you can do is you can simplify the problem a bit. I will just briefly show it. So you can, um, in this case, uh, restrict uh, on the outer edges here because of the symmetry in minus one and plus one, you can restrict to, to positive incoming uh, strength. You can combine the, them to the, to the absolute um, sum here. Um, 
you can assume, okay, if we we don't need several strengths on those edges here, we can just take the maximum value overall and assign everywhere the same strength. And then finally, you can use this function uh, with a constraint before and now try to, to minimize this one single J bar. And this is what I'm doing currently. And I observe that um, the final optimization problem is close to, to a graph property, which is called expansion. And there um, we know that it's easy for trees and as we can restrict with these uh, embeddings, we can restrict on trees because we only want to have them connected. Um, I, I am going to show that actually this, this exponential number of constraints is not needed, but we can uh, simplify it and calculate it in polynomial time. But this uh, work still needs to be finished. So I hope to finish my PhD end of the year. And then maybe I can show you the results about this. All right. So now uh, let's come to this overview again. So now we have uh, done all the stuff, and we have uh, now our we now formulated our restricted Ising problem over the Chimera, and now we can use this to go actually on the machine because it just accepts the the coefficient as the machine instruction and several physical parameters that influence the annealing process. And as I'm not a physicist, I don't, uh, I don't really know what that means uh, and how they influence the process, really. Um, it also depends. Each instance of the same problem can have, can, could be optimized better with different parameters. So there's this annealing time which is typically about 20 microseconds. Um, and the, the, the sampling size, so how much answers you want from the machine, because it's so fast calculating one solution, you can get a bunch of them uh, in a very short time. But of course, um, because of this quantum nature and all the uh, probability, uh, probabilities behind it, you don't know uh, how uh, or if you at all get the, the optimal solution or if the solution, the best solution the machine gives you, if it's really the optimum, it does not prove it. It just gives you from the sampling one, or it gives you the whole sample, but there you just choose the one with the lowest energy, but you don't know if it's the optimum or not. So, and it's unclear how those parameters influence the success probability. So, uh, usually you need to evaluate the return sample afterwards using statistical methods. Uh, if you know the optimal value in advance, usually you, you don't know. Um, uh, you can ask if it has been found and how often, or you can check if the embedding broke, uh, so if there are chains which are broken, or do you still fulfill the constraints? So was the penalty weight chosen high enough? Or uh, if you sampled, for example, you can have a look at uh, the, the uniformity of the sampling. So usually you need to do a lot of statistics afterwards. Um, and you don't know if the, the value you got is actually your optimal value. All right, just to sum it up, uh, here are the necessary steps again. So first of all, you need to reduce to a cubo by binary encoding and degree reduction. You need to put the constraints inside the objective function via penalty terms and choosing um, waiting for it. Then from if you started with a cubo, you do this affine transformation to an Ising problem. Um, afterwards trying to get the embedded Ising problem. So certainly by a good guess, or if you know some embedding, um, you need to have this interaction graph embedded into the chimera and the weight distribution over the embedded qubit. So here are the main big questions still. And finally, you choose some suitable annealing parameters and hope for the best. <laughs>
All right, and that's it with my presentation. Uh, yeah, if there are any questions, let me know.